Hello and welcome to Seven Days of Science. In the news this week, uh, some small fossils of the prehistoric orangutan Gigantopithecus have been found. There's also been a new wading dinosaur and also uh, the emerging field of paleorobotics is going to be discovered and much, much more. Steve? What are you doing? What are you doing? Nothing. Yeah. Stolen our Seven Days of Science. You've recorded the intro for Seven Days of Science? Yeah. Oh, that's all right, I don't have to do it now. Just quickly before we get into the stories, in case you haven't seen the announcements yet, be sure to subscribe to the new Seven Days of Science YouTube channel so you can still keep up to date with the latest science news when we move the series there. Also be sure to check out our sponsor Curiosity Box and use our link in the description with the code FOSSIL for discounts. It's yeah. the body deck! The body. <laughs> it's the one I wanted! <laughs> It's so cool! Do you want to come over there? Come First up in the news for this week, we've got a fascinating suggestion that could finally give us an answer to a big question about one of our biggest neighbours. The red supergiant star Betelgeuse sits at probably only around 650 light years away and is the second closest red supergiant to Earth. One of the particularly exciting things about Betelgeuse is that it is nearing the end of its life, in cosmic terms at least. It's believed that Betelgeuse will die in just the next few thousand years, although it's possible it may last for hundreds of thousands more. A long time for us, but a very short time for a star. When it dies, because of its size, it will go supernova, and because of how close it is to Earth, it will be visible in our skies while it does so, even during the day. Back during the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020, it was thought this time was much closer than we thought, as Betelgeuse dimmed significantly. However, research following this event has suggested that the dimming was caused by an event separate to the star's imminent death. A cool spot or obstruction by dust were both suggested, but researchers have now come up with an altogether more intriguing possibility. A new study published in the Astrophysical Journal has looked at the possible reasons for it dimming and came to a very interesting hypothesis indeed. The researchers involved believe the most likely reason for the dimming was that the red giant has a companion star, making it a part of a binary star system. Now this second star, if it exists, would be much much smaller than Betelgeuse, potentially only twice our own sun's mass. Now as cool as this might be, we have no direct evidence of this yet. This result, as the researchers point out, is merely inference. So more direct evidence is needed, and the team are looking to have a window of opportunity to view Betelgeuse towards the end of the year. In other news, we have a story from last week where a study published in the journal PNAS has taken a look at the effect a rather massive meteorite impact had on life on Earth. This was very early life on Earth, which was probably a good thing because this meteorite, called S2, was very large and very destructive, estimated to be anywhere from 50 to 200 times the size of the asteroid that is thought to have caused the KPG extinction event that wiped out the non-bird dinosaurs. S2 hit the Earth about 3 billion years ago, so life really was in its infancy, relatively speaking. The S2 impact was so catastrophic that it caused a gigantic tsunami, the ocean to partially evaporate, and a global darkness that likely harmed shallow water photosynthesis. Strangely enough though, this study reveals that the impact also had positive effects on early life. Among the effects that the impact had as it smashed into the planet, churned up rock and threw material everywhere, was increasing nutrients and iron supply for the life that was still around and hadn't been squished. The researchers think that this could have caused microbial blooms and that life recovered very rapidly after the impact. A rather captivating study that sheds some much needed light on such a terrifying early event in the history of life on Earth. Also in the news for this week, paleontologists have revealed some very interesting Jurassic pterosaur fossils that preserve the remains of their last meals. The fossils were found in Germany and two pterosaurs belonging to two different species were identified. One of them, called Dorignathus, was found associated with scattered fish bones, while the second species, called Campylognathoides, was discovered to have tiny hooklets from the arms of a kind of extinct squid relative known as a belemnoid within its abdominal region. This is therefore the first example of pterosaur gut contents preserving cephalopod remains and the first convincing evidence that these flying reptiles 
would have fed on belemnoids. The paleontologists further suggest that, considering the different skull anatomies of Dorognathus and Campylognathoides, these pterosaurs may have been specialised to feed on different kinds of aquatic prey, with Dorognathus feeding on fish, while Campylognathoides was a cephalopod hunter. Building on this, there's a possibility that this also indicates Campylognathoides was a nocturnal hunter, feeding at night when the belemnoids would vertically migrate towards the water's surface. Although more fossils preserving evidence of diet in these pterosaurs would be needed to confirm these hypotheses, these are some really fascinating fossils giving us a tantalizing glimpse into the lives of these long extinct flying reptiles. Next, a very interesting publication reports on the discovery of some more fossil remains of the enigmatic giant extinct orangutan Gigantopithecus. This huge ape inhabited China up until about 200,000 years ago and is only known from fossil jaws and teeth. Gigantopithecus may have been able to achieve a body mass of up to 300 kilograms or 47 stone, although the incompleteness of its remains makes size estimates difficult, but they were undoubtedly pretty enormous apes. These new fossil finds are more teeth, three premolars and six molars, and they come from a cave in southwestern China called the Meiziwan Cave. Very intriguingly, although the anatomy of the teeth is similar to other Gigantopithecus teeth, they are smaller than many of the previously found teeth. These teeth came from adults as well as older adult individuals, as shown by the high instances of tooth cavities, and the overall body size of these particular Gigantopithecus individuals was likely smaller than other populations. Going by the other animal remains also found in this cave, it seems that these Gigantopithecus lived quite early on in the Pleistocene epoch, and so they potentially represent an early point in Gigantopithecus evolution. It seems that, like with other animals found as fossils in the region, such as giant pandas and tapirs, the Gigantopithecus lineage became larger in size over the course of the Pleistocene epoch, potentially due to changes in the climate as the region became cooler. Indeed, other Gigantopithecus teeth that date to the early part of the Pleistocene do seem to be smaller than later populations, so these new discoveries fall under this degree of variation. It's a fascinating new find that adds to our still very limited fossil record of this amazing extinct ape. Hopefully we can find some more of its skeleton at some point soon. Ape together strong. Also in the recent paleontology news, we welcome a new species of dinosaur this week. It's a new kind of oviraptorosaur, a small kind of feathered dinosaur, and it was found in early Cretaceous age rocks in China, dating back over 100 million years ago. It's been named Yuanyang Long Bainian, which has an adorable meaning. Yuanyang comes from the Mandarin for lovebirds, also known as Mandarin ducks, referencing the traditional belief that these birds form lifelong pairs since the fossils of the new dinosaur species preserve two individuals next to each other in one block. Long comes from the transliteration of the Chinese word for dragon. So this is the lovebird dragon. The two Yuanyang Long individuals preserved in this block of stone are both articulated partial skeletons, with one of them also including a partial skull. The features of their bones indicate that this is indeed a new species, and one that's quite significant for understanding the evolution of oviraptorosaurs. Looking at the anatomy, the paleontologists who have named this species realize that Yuanyang Long shows an interesting mixture of both primitive or basal and derived features. So it represents an interesting intermediate point of these dinosaurs' evolution. Not only that, but its hind limbs are quite different from all other oviraptorosaurs, but they look very similar to modern wading birds. So this little dinosaur might have been wading into bodies of water to feed. Gastroliths were also found in these fossils, stones that the dinosaurs swallowed to help them grind up food. This indicates that Yuanyang Long had a gastric mill where food would get ground up, like in modern birds. But this seems to contrast with later, more advanced oviraptorosaurs, which appear to lack them and may have had some other kind of specialized mode of digestion, potentially involving grinding tough foods in the mouth. So this is a really fascinating and important new dinosaur species. Lastly in the paleontology news for this week, a paper has been published that reviews the emerging field of paleorobotics. They discuss how paleontologically inspired robots can be used to help answer questions about the biomechanics and evolution of long extinct animals. They go through a few case studies of paleorobots that have already been used, such as robotic plesiosaurs that have been used to work out how they might have moved through the water, and a salamander-inspired robot that was used to investigate how an early terrestrial vertebrate may have walked and produced trackways. Paleorobotics has already been a very useful field in determining how various kinds of prehistoric organisms moved, and the review also argues that it has a lot of potential 
for studying major evolutionary transitions in locomotory styles, such as the water to land transitions of different animal lineages. There are many challenges still to be overcome, but it seems to be a very promising developing area of paleontological investigation. Also in the recent news, some concerning findings about our oceans have been made. The Gorinj Seamount is the tallest underwater mountain in Western Europe, and is located in the Atlantic Ocean, 200 kilometers off the Portuguese coast. A recent scientific expedition observed many rare and threatened species there, and recorded more than 40 species for the first time. As seamounts usually attract many predators, the scientists also expected to see many predatory fish here, such as sharks. However, the researchers did not see any sharks in the area, which has greatly worried them, highlighting the major threats that human activities such as deep sea mining and overfishing pose to our oceans. It's hoped that the data collected from a series of expeditions to this area will inform recommendations in a bid to establish a marine protected area at the Gorinj Seamount. Ending on a happier note though, AI has helped scientists have a 20 minute conversation with a humpback whale named Twain. Using an underwater speaker, the team of scientists played a recorded humpback contact call into the ocean. Over a 20 minute period, Twain responded to each playback call matching the interval variations between signals. The scientists were amazed and thrilled with this exchange, which along with their complex social systems, tool making abilities, and extensive communication through songs and social calls, highlights just how intelligent these majestic creatures are. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Also, as I said at the beginning, in case you've missed the announcements, be sure to subscribe to the new 7 Days of Science channel if you want to keep watching this show. 7 Days of Science will be moving there in the next few weeks and will no longer be uploaded on this channel, so make sure you're subscribed to the new one to keep up to date. Links will be in the description and also be sure to follow the new 7 Days of Science Instagram account too. Also be sure to check out the curiosity box and sign up for it using our link and use the code FOSSIL for some great discounts. You can watch the review video we did on the box in the recent arachnids video. Okay, see you next week.